Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. Today we are discussing a vintage Hoya Ottavia 1163. This is the Viceroy edition. The best watch you could buy with a pocket full of change and a few cigarette proofs of purchase back in 1972. You can see and you can purchase this micro rotor automatic chronograph on our website. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you enjoy these videos. And please click on the card in the upper right hand corner of the screen at any time during this video to see our full sales listing for this watch with additional accessories included in the sale, high resolution images for your desktop, and naturally complete pricing details for this vintage. 1972 Hoyer Ottavia 1163, the Viceroy edition, caliber 12. So the watch on my wrist represented a little bit of a promotion. Happily, this is an example of a watch that was part of a massive co-branding without any actual co-branding on the dial, case, or caliber. So while well, yes, you pretty much had to smoke yourself to death to get one in the early 70s, today only the nomenclature remains. This is the Viceroy iteration of the well-loved automatic Ottavia 1163. So let's talk a little bit about how it fits and then we can get deeper into the technical and historical aspects. It's an easy watch to wear, comfortable and cushion shaped. This is the shape of the 1970s. A broad tonneau, or I should say maybe neo tonneau shape. 47.5 millimeters from lug to lug and 42 millimeters across the case from what would conventionally be nine to three. That's not including the crown or the chronograph pushers. The watch is fairly thick, although perhaps not as thick as it looks. 15.2 millimeters thick. It does have a rounded flank to it. As you can see, the side of the watch does slope up dramatically over several planes, the crown, the case, the bezel, and the plexiglass crystal. So you shouldn't have any difficulty wearing this one with formal attire. Now I will mention that the watch has a few streaks on its plexiglass glass, all of which can be removed with a pencil eraser, but I am at the mercy of my supplies within the office today, and we are a paperless office here at Watchbox Reviews. So the timepiece on my wrist is in excellent condition inside and out. Don't mind the plexiglass. It does have a fairly standard lug spacing. Should you wish to accessorize, 20 millimeters is the spacing, and the watch is on an extraordinary period bracelet, and I'm just going to show you how flush this fits and it requires no adjustment. It's an American made Spiegel extensible elastic metal bracelet. It is a wonderful piece that is so in character with the watch and redolent of its times. It's almost as period classic as the fact that this watch was available in a cigarette promotion and no one thought that was weird. So the timepiece is easy to wear because there are no adjustments required. And it's easy to love because it's a charmingly quirky vintage piece from a historic model line. So you can see the timepiece is, let's get really close here and maybe even give ourselves a little bit more aperture and brightness. Uh, the timepiece is completely intact. The bracelet has no kinks, no compromise, no corrosion. It's a wonderful piece that is a little bit of a pleasure to wear and an exotic experience for those who have never worn an extensible 1970s bracelet. My dad had one of these during the 80s. I thought it was something of a miracle when I was a little kid and frankly it still intrigues me. You can see the case is simple. I call it a neo tonneau because if the first round of tonneau watches came about in the 19 teens, 20s and 30s, the tonneau form, or at the very least, the extended non-round elongated watch had a second golden era in the 1970s and this is one of the best examples. You can see how intact this watch is. First of all, you can even read the reference number between the lugs of this watch and you can see that the original factory finish, the imaginary center point sunburst that radiates out to the tops of the of the case, this is another form of characteristic 70s design. This imaginary center point sunburst on the case top. That is almost entirely intact with only a few scratches and scuffs. It appears that it may never have been refinished, so this is the ultimate survivor right here. What you can also see is that the bevels along the case flank are entirely intact, that they run the same width from side to side on both sides of the watch, and you'll note that the correct knurled crowns are in place, as is the period correct Hoyer crown, so this one is all of a piece. You'll note some of the characteristic traits of the Viceroy edition in particular, starting with a weird bezel. It's a weird bezel and it's entirely intact. You can see the aluminum insert scarcely has a scratch on it, and that's usually the first thing to go when these watches are treated roughly, but it is a rotating tachymeter scale, so it 
may be used for timing if you get your bearings. Now you just look at points along the scale that represent one quarter of the way through and you can do that and use it as a conventional timing mechanism like a dive bezel or you can align it properly with the index of 12 and use it as a tachymeter to actually time something alongside a racetrack. And I assume you are using this watch to time some sort of a vintage race car. The perfect timepiece for the Monterey Historics, this is a watch that is period correct to the 1970s automotive scene, as the Viceroy tobacco promotion was also linked to a motorsports themed ad campaign. And at the time, the Autavia, originally envisioned in 1962 as an automotive or aviation timer, had moved moved decisively in the direction of automotive. Along with the Carrera and the Monaco, trackside scenes were rife with Hoyer in the early 1970s. Now, some of the features of the Viceroy edition include these somewhat humpbacked and faceted indices the fact that there are red inlays within the hands that the hour and minute hand terminate with red tips and then there's a full calibration hour register at nine o'clock on the dial so 12 hours rather than just fragments of the hourly count the timepiece does feature an all original dial and i wish i could really get much closer here let me see how close i can get i'm at the mercy of my focal length but the dial don't be deceived by the somewhat streaked plexiglass. That's easy to refinish. It's the dial that is entirely original, perfectly crisp, immaculately printed. All of the spacings are absolutely as they left Switzerland in 1972. It is a matte dial. It has no tarnish. I'm not a fan of vintage patina in any way, shape, or form. I like my watches to be entirely original. I have no need to advertise damage as charming. Patina is not my thing, and that's why this watch is very much for me. As you can see, there is absolutely no sign of oxidation, tarnish, or degradation. The indices have not been moved. The print has not been reapplied. Nothing has been wiped and and redialed, and even the hands are bereft of the rough handling marks often accumulated over years of servicing. This is a watch that represents as close to a true survivor as you're going to find. And again, don't be deceived by that plexiglass. That's a disposable part anyway, and you can refinish it with a pencil eraser. Inside the case, you have the Caliber 12. This was the second version of the Chronomatic Caliber 11, a automatic sandwich movement that was developed alongside Hamilton, Buren, and Breitling during the late 1960s. Now, whether you think the Zenith El Primero or the Seiko 6139 was the first automatic chronograph to market, they were so tightly clustered that each one is historically important in its own right, but the betting man would probably wager that the Caliber 11 family was first. Now, the Caliber 12 as used in the Otavia 1163 Viceroy is an upgraded higher beat version of the original. It beats way at 21,600 vibrations per hour. It also features some changes to the calendar and mainspring system to make it a bit more reliable. It has a 40 to 42 hour power reserve and it represents the combination of two elements that made it the first ever automatic modular chronograph movement. So you had a Buren 1280 micro rotor automatic base and then you had a Dubois de Praz 8510 chronograph module on top of it. And the assembly of the two created the first production automatic chronograph caliber. Once more, I want to give you a close look at this case because I showed you the dial under high magnification and high resolution, but I haven't done another case sweep since I adjusted my focus. You can see that that sun ray finish along the hoods of the case is entirely intact with only a few scratches and scuffs. This watch has not been refinished, nor would we consider refinishing it. I recommend the next buyer of this museum piece watch essentially wear it on non-rainy days, maintain it in original condition, and accept the fact that it is not 100%, but it may be as close to factory as any piece you will ever encounter from the Viceroy 1163 reference range. A watch that is gorgeous, anachronistic, redolent of its era, and yet timeless in its significance. You can see and you can purchase this vintage Hoyer Ortavia 1163 Viceroy on our website.